<gasps> and sing. Cut. Good evening, you two. I am back. I'm going to start reading a lot of uh, newspapers because I don't know if a lot of you actually take the time to sit down and read. But it's always a good thing to know what's going on in our trucking community. So I find that to be something I feel like that can be very informative to start to do on my channel. It's to pretty much pick the paper up. And for people that just don't like to read, I don't mind to take the paper out and read it for you guys. So this video really, though, is to address a uh, subscriber's request. She was asking me about taxes as a lease operator. And um, I want to go over some of that stuff. So, you know, let's look at some of the stuff that I have. Hmm. What'd you say? If it's not charging, then what? If it is Yeah, guys, I'm trying to get this presentation together so I can go over some facts. But obviously, when you're doing a video, you have to have more than one device, one recording you, and one that you're doing some of the presentation off of. So I got this dang Galaxy Note 4 that I used to have. I think it needs another battery because the power on this thing really sucks. But until this thing boots up, back to what I was talking about with the taxes. She was saying, um, what can you use as deductions? Matter of fact, once it's boot up, I can tell you exactly what she said. But she was saying, what can you use for deductions? And pretty much any and everything. I mean, things like supplies you buy for your truck, like tools. If you buy boots, if you buy work clothes, if you buy food. But food only has, I'm not too sure. But for what I'm hearing, you only get a certain amount of allowance on food, which is called per diem. But I know they use per diem differently for a W-2 workers versus a 1099 worker. But what I do is my CPA lady, I don't have to really worry. Like I don't, it don't have to boggle my mind up because all she told me to do and all I've been knowing to do is to pretty much any time that I go to the store and I spend some money, I get the receipt. Thank you, lady. And I, like I said before in another video, I put it in my white envelope for that month. And I don't care what receipt it is. I don't care if it was a receipt for some tissue to wipe my ass. I take that receipt for that tissue, put it in that envelope, and if it's a tax deduction, she can even just toss it to the side or put it in for my deductions for the year. And pretty much is you can file your taxes quarterly. You can file them um, semi-quarterly. Like you can file them every three months. You can file them every six months. Or you can file them once a year. I file mine once a year because my CPA lady, I mean, I've only been with her for a year, and this is only my second year in trucking. Last year, she got me back a pretty good refund, and I'm pretty sure it's because I had a W-2 mixed in there, so I really want to know what my next year is going to turn out to be, but I really believe that uh, this year, I end up breaking even, because obviously, when you start a business, you want to spend your, especially your first year, investing into your company, because obviously, you're trying to get the equipment, you're trying to get what the business needs, you got to spend money for startup. So majority of the first year or a couple years, you're probably going to break even with your business because you're trying to get it off the ground. Like it's not quite mature enough to where it's off the ground. So a lot of your first couple years is going to definitely be a tax write-off. And it'll probably be to where you shouldn't owe, owe too much because you should have a hell of a lot of deductions. I know if you lease a truck, that lease payment is a bigger write-off than if you paid the truck off and you don't have any payment. So people can talk junk about me leasing this and that, but at the end of the day, that's a huge write-off that's going to help me out at the end of the year. So this phone is not trying to boot up, but I'm probably going to have to end up doing a part two. Um, yeah, they have to do it more formally, but pretty much the CPA, if you have a good CPA lady, you don't have to really worry about that. The only thing you should worry about is keeping your receipts organized to send it to your CPA lady. Keep up with your settlements so that you can send it into your CPA lady. The main thing you're going to need as far as paperwork on your end to make sure you supply to your, your uh, tax accountant is your bank statements for that month, your settlements for that month, all your receipts of everything. I mean everything. You can even write off your personal car because you can say that you used it for business ventures. You can even write off an office space in your house because you can say you use it for your business venture. There's a whole lot of things 
that you can write off. So it just throw the receipt, hotel stays, um, fuel, fuel on your truck, tires, uh, maintenance, like all those oil changes I get, tax write off. So anything, anything that you feel, matter of fact, just throw all the receipts, write them off on an envelope, throw all the receipts in it for that month and mail them into your CPA lady. And yeah, and like I said, at the end of the day, by you mailing them every month, some people do it differently. So a lot of guys, they send all their receipts at the end of the year to their CPA lady. Me, I mail my receipts every month. So by the end of the year, by the time it's time to file, she doesn't have to sift through all the receipts because she's been keeping my books up by the month. And by the end of the year, I don't really have to pay for her to file because I've been paying a fee for every month to send my receipts. And so all she got to do is plug in the numbers into the IRS software and file my taxes and see what it is. So um, before I get off here, I'm going to read this quick um, article. It's called E-Roads and FMCSA provides webinar aimed to clarify logging for personal conveyance agriculture exemptions. So um, Clint Laurie, Clint Laurie at the truckers.com. And this is what it looks like. Okay, let me try to hurry up. All right, so rules are rules, but for every rule, there are exceptions. And that's when things can get murky. When the ELD mandate went into effect December 18th, 2017, it was just another day for those who had been using ELDs for years. But for the other drivers and couriers who wanted to operate within the regulation but hadn't necessarily always been worried about the fine detail, it was the start of an age of anxiety. Knowing that every little move and non-move was on the record, the Federal Motor Courier Safety Administration recently tried to provide clarity to two areas of most concern and confusion, personal conveyance and the agriculture exception by providing their official definition and some regulatory counsel for each. In order to clear the air a little more, ELD manufacturers E-Rose conducted a webinar July 24th. It was co-hosted by Joe DeLorenzo, FMCSA's Director of Enforcement and Compliance, and Sona Lee, E-Rose Director of Regulatory Compliance, explaining how and when those rules apply and how to record them. DeLorenzo opened by acknowledging that determining when driving can be considered personal conveyance can seem tricky. Simply ask yourself two questions, he said. First, is the driver released from duty? And second, is the driving for personal purposes only? If you keep these two thoughts in mind, it starts to get clearer whether the personal conveyance rule applies or not. I think it's important to talk about personal conveyance for what it really is, DeLorenzo said. A Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration graphic shows how the hours of service agricultural exemption works. Once a truck comes within 150 mile air miles of agriculture source pickup location, no time spent working within that radius counts towards HOS calculations. So, um, let me see. I think this continues on page eight. I don't really want this video to go too long, so let me see if I can hurry up and catch it so that we can um, try to wrap this video up real quick. All right, so it's an off-duty status. That's where the whole consideration of where something is personal conveyance starts. Take commuting, DeLorenzo said. This one can get people in a little trip up. Commuting between home and a terminal or work site using a CMV is considered personal conveyance, he said. Where this one gets trickier is where the driver is under dispatch when they leave the house. If a driver loads up before going home, anticipating he'll hit the road first thing in the morning, or if the driver gets up and heads straight to a pickup, the driver is then under direction of the carrier. Another common question is when a driver stops at the rest stop for the night, then wants to go get something to eat, that drive to the restaurant is personal conveyance. But if along the way you also fill up the gas tank, that would be considered work related. So the trip would no longer qualify as personal conveyance. It's the intent of the driving that matters, DeLorenzo said. 
Are you off duty? And is the movement strictly for personal reasons? De Lorenzo used another common scenario. Suppose it takes longer than planned to load, load up, and you're running out of hours to find a safe legal place to park. That extra time beyond your 14 hours that is will take take to find a place for the night will fall under personal conveyance. And the same would be true if you stop somewhere and a law enforcement officer tells you that you have to move on. This is where you put an annotation in. You put a note in that that says what happened and why he said, the key to personal conveyance is documentation, Lee said. ELDs include a personal convey duty status option. The thing to remember is whenever that status is engaged, an explanation for the mileage must be entered into the log. Another option, Lee said, is to remain logged out during a personal conveyance and again have that written explanation to account for the miles driven. Delaverso and Lee stressed that personal conveyance time is an off duty status, but drivers must stick to the same safety standard that always drive by. And while there are no regulations about how much time a driver can spend on personal conveyance, it is important to use enough of those 10 hours of downtime to get adequate rest. The agriculture exemption makes the time a driver spends within 150 air mile radius of the source of an agriculture commodity exempt from counting towards hours of service. Much of the uncertainty about this exemption has to do with definition. Lorenzo said, a lot of people get confused over the term agriculture commodity. An agriculture commodity is a non-processed food, feed, fiber, or livestock, De Lorenzo said. Non-processed, he added, means it can be packaged, but it has to still be in its original form. As long as it is still a head of lettuce, it's fine. If it is in a bag of mixed greens, well, it's not an agriculture commodity anymore. Another word that hangs up a lot of people is source, De Lorenzo said. The source can be an original source like a farm or a ranch or an intermediate facility such as a grain elevator or sale barn. How the exemption works, De Lorenzo explained, is to put a circle with a radius of 150 miles around the source. If you're operating within 150 air miles of the source, then the HOS regulation do not apply. The clock stops the moment you enter the circle on your way to the source. Loading, traveling to other stops to load or unload, then heading off to the drop-off location. None of that goes towards HOS. The clock starts as soon as you leave the circle. If that destination is 300 miles away, you could, you could cover half of that before the clock starts towards HOS, De Lorenzo explained. De Lorenzo clarified a few points. If loading occurs at more than one site that... The age exemption radius for the entire job is based on the location of the first loading point. You can create a string of exempt zones. If you drive out of the circle and the clock starts when your route brings you back into the circle, then the clock stops again, De Lorenzo said. It's important to log the age exemption properly, Lee said, and there are three options for doing it. The first is to simply not log in until you reach the 150 mile radius. All the driving had been done was show as unidentified driving. You then reject those identified miles in the note that time was age exempt that began normal recording. Option two is to log in at the beginning, then a note to exempt and non-exempt time later, Lee said. You could also use the personal conveyance option to separate that time your age exempt. That kind of a tidy little option just because it puts everything in the off-duty line because, okay, Lee and Dorenzo noted that the key thing they want to get across is that, that a driver log doesn't begin and end with the ELD. Everybody thinks there's this magic thing that says, hi, you're in violation, and spits out a ticket. Dorenzo said, but what the law enforcement officer gets is your full ELD record, including the annotations. The ELD device is not ultimately making the decision whether you're compliant or not, that's the law enforcement officer's job, and they're going to review those annotations. To watch the webinar in its entirety, go to https semicolon slash forward slash forward slash register dot go to webinar dot com forward slash record 
uh, recordings forward slash two eight five six eight nine six six three nine one three zero zero nine seven nine three three. Let me see if I can show you that that was sure enough. 